winter would prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hold Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He must hold me fast This Saturday afternoon, we'll have the funeral service from my Uncle Steve Chapel, and I appreciate your prayers for our family. And I was thinking about my uncle. Of course, I've been thinking about him every day these last several days. Several years ago, the last time we had the Spiritual Leadership Asia Conference, he traveled with us, and he spoke at one of the businessmen's sessions in that uh, businessman's track. And he shared a story, a testimony, about how he learned to trust God more. And uh, he shared the story about a part of the farm that I have spent a lot of time on. And it's a piece of property that God gave him many years ago. And most of it is uh, bean fields and wheat fields. But a big part of it is wooded land. It butts up against the national forest and um, just a beautiful property. And he told the story to the businessmen about how he had spent so much time uh, developing a water well up on the property and grooming the fields and uh, creating water sources for the wildlife and how uh, herds of animals had come onto the property. And uh, some years in the dryland farming business, your crops aren't really as much as you would hope. And so he began to guide some hunters and develop quite a, quite a side business of uh, guiding hunters and wildlife excursions on the property. And he said one day he was standing at the ranch house on that property and he looked up into the forested area 
few miles away. And he said the flames were so large you could see them leaping from tree to tree as he looked up into his property. And that day, hundreds of acres of trees burned. He said he got out there with his son, a few of the neighbors. They're so far from a town or from firemen, they just tried to get shovels and tractors and stop it, but they couldn't stop much of it. He said that day he lost more than half of the wooded property that God had given him so many years ago. And he said, I stood there the next day full of soot and tired from all of the battling of that fire, and I began to think about what the Lord wanted me to learn from that tragedy. And he told those businessmen there, he said, the Lord spoke to my heart that I had been loving this farm and this ranch more than I should. That I had put too much of my heart into this world. And he said, the Lord was teaching me that I needed to learn how to trust him when he gives and when he takes away. That the Christian life, he said, is all about learning to trust Jesus every step of the way. I'm so thankful that I had such a godly teacher in my life as my Uncle Steve. And I believe that God, even tonight, wants to teach all of us how to trust him just a little bit more. And I know these messages have been a help to me in that regard. And Dr. Getch, we thank you for all that you've shared from the Word, and we look forward to this final message tonight as you come. Thank you, Pastor, and uh, trust that God will greatly honor you in uh, your trust in Him this week, and just putting Him first and being in your place, and I commend you for that along with Pastor, and certainly it's been a joy to open the Word of God with you as you've given attention to it and response to it. And uh, we trust that, as Pastor said a moment ago, though the meetings end tonight, as far as a formal meeting, the revival ought to just begin. And uh, we trust that'll be the case as we go through this year of 2023. Take your Bible. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. We'll read one verse. I'm not going to tell you which one until you get there. If I tell you which one, you won't even look at it. We're going to look at several verses in the passage. But Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Only a full trust will prevent a flawed trust. Only a full trust, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Only a full trust will prevent a flawed trust. It's interesting when you read the Bible that many of God's commands are what we could call a couplet. That is, they contain a do and a don't. And such is the case here in verse number five. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not under thine own understanding. So here's what we need to do. Trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And at the same time, here's what we shouldn't do. And that is to lean unto our own understanding. The leaning tower of Pisa is a freestanding bell tower of the Pisa Cathedral in Italy. The height of this tower is 183 feet 3 inches on the low side. On the high side, it's 185 feet 11 inches, a difference of 2 feet 8 inches. If you take the stairs to the seventh floor of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it'll depend on which side of the tower you choose to take the stairs as to how many steps you need to climb. On the low side, 
there are 294 steps. On the high side, there are 296 steps. The tower began leaning during construction in the 12th century due to soft ground. By 1990, the tilt of this tower had reached 5.5 degrees. Stabilizing work was done in 1993 and again in 2001, and it reduced that lean to 3.97 degrees. Now, we enter the new year, Pastor unveils the theme, trust in him. Yes, awesome, that is great. And we see it all through the scripture, do we not? I mean, we could probably preach 365 nights of 2023 and find a text in the Bible that would instruct us to trust him. The Bible is filled with this admonition to trust in the Lord, to trust in him. And we, we hear the theme, we, we, we get engaged in it, we, we pastor preaches these opening messages of the year, and we, we realize, yes, this is what I need, this is what God has for me, and I'm going to trust him. And we get to March, and we start to lean to our own understanding. And we get to July, and the degree of tilt has gotten even greater. Why is that? We know the theme is right. We know the Bible supports the theme. This is not some kind of motivational theme that pastors decided we need for the year. We have seen in the scriptures that God wants us to trust in him. So what happens as we enter into a year fully determined to trust the Lord this year? Yet we find ourselves at times leaning to our own understanding. Could I suggest soft ground? There is something wrong with the foundation. You see, you can bring in a crew to try to adjust the lean of your life. As many have tried to adjust the lean of this tower in Italy. We might think, well, you know, if some of the circumstances in my life would change, I could trust the Lord more. If, if maybe some of the conditions would change, maybe if the wind wouldn't blow as hard, I wouldn't lean as much. Maybe if we add two steps on this side, it'll look more level. Maybe we just put a flat roof over it. It'll appear to be right. But the truth is, we've got to go back to the foundation, don't we? And the foundation of our trust is God himself. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The lean will not be fixed because some condition or circumstance in our life changes. The lean must be fixed in the foundation. Now, sometimes we don't even realize that we're starting to lean because we are the tower, and sometimes from our perspective, all seems fine. We think, well, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm doing okay. Someone else may look at our life, however, and realize that we're beginning to drift or we're beginning to stray. We're beginning to lean in some area to our own understanding. And we don't notice it that our trust in him has become soft. So this chapter three in Proverbs reveals five critical areas 
where we are likely to lean. And tonight, from this chapter, we want to see how can we shore up this foundation of trust in the Lord. The first critical area where we are prone to lean is we lean in our decisions. Look at verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In all your ways, in all your decisions, in all of your direction for life, acknowledge him. And he, as you make those decisions based on trusting him, he will direct your path. Isn't it true, we have to admit this, that oftentimes we make decisions based on common sense. At least common sense to me. Or we might make a logical decision, we think. Or we might make a decision based on past experience in a similar situation. This is what I did before. Uh, this is what somebody told me they did. And we base a decision on experience. Or we might make a decision based on supposed results or supposed success if we make that decision. Or perhaps we are influenced in that decision by peer pressure, what other people are doing. Or we might just make a decision based on convenience, what is comfortable, what, what is convenient to do. But what does God say? In all thy ways... Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go, and I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in by bit and bridle. How does a life that maybe starts out the year trusting in him, how does a life by March or May or October, how does it become an unbridled life? How all of a sudden is that person finding themselves on a path of an unbridled tongue or an unbridled thought life? or an unbridled lust, or an unbridled appetite, or an unbridled pride, or an unbridled anxiety, or an unbridled jealousy, or an unbridled pride. How is it that over the course of time, all of a sudden, we're leaning? Why? Because we're making decisions in our life on a daily basis without acknowledging him. We are making decisions on our experience, on what's logical, on what's convenient, what everybody else is doing, rather than trusting in the Lord. What decisions are you making tonight without acknowledging the Lord? I don't do the counseling that Pastor Chapel does or Dr. Crabb would do, but I do a fair amount. and It's interesting that sometimes in counseling you will ask somebody, now, how did you come to this decision? Because oftentimes people come for counseling and they say, this is what I decided to do. <laughs> and so you're wondering, is this counseling or is this you telling me something, right? So they say, this is what I decided to do. And, and, and you might ask, well, how did you arrive at that decision? And they'll say, well, I prayed about it. And I prayed about it. And when you prayed about it, what did he tell you to do? Just praying about it isn't enough. When you're trusting him, you're waiting for him to direct your path. 
You say, well, I prayed about it and he didn't tell me anything. Then it would be kind of dumb to do anything. Right? I mean, let's not hide behind some spiritual veneer here. So I prayed about it. Okay. So what did he tell you? Well, I really didn't hang around to listen. I just prayed about it. I told him what I wanted to do. I told him what some options were. And, and so I decided this would be best. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path. God will show you a plain path if you're trusting in him. Now, if you come to God and say, God, this is what I decided to do. I just want to let you know. So I can tell pastor I prayed about it. He's not going to show you a plain path. Your path's going to be very foggy. Your path is going to be very unclear. And you're going to find yourself down the road in life in a very confused state. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. And so we begin to lean in our decisions. But secondly, this proverb teaches us that we begin to lean in our dangers. Look at verse 7. He says, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Now, I think we know this, but while we want to allow the Lord to lead us in the right way, in the right decisions... Let's make sure we remember that the devil at the same time is trying to lead us to make the wrong decisions, right? I mean, God is always trying to direct us in the right way. But as soon as you start going that right way, the devil's going to come along and try to get you to go the wrong way. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. There couldn't be any, a greater contrast in all the world than that. God's trying to get you to go one way. You may be here tonight and, and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Well, I know what God wants in your life. He wants you to be saved. Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're not saved, I can guarantee you on the basis of that book, the Bible, that God wants you to be saved. That's his will. But that's not what the devil's going to tell you. Ah, that's, that's foolishness. You don't, need, you, don't, you don't need to be saved. So every decision that Christ and God are, and the Holy Spirit are encouraging you to make and guiding you to make, the devil's going to try to show you an alternate path. Now, the smaller our trust in the Lord is, the greater the temptation to sin is going to be. If we allow a soft foundation here in our life, and all of a sudden the devil begins to erode our trust, don't be surprised when the temptation to go the wrong way increases. Because a decrease in trust is going to lead to an increase in temptation. And this is where we lean in that danger time in our life when the devil attacks, when he brings the pressure, when he brings some temptation. This is where we're vulnerable to leaning. How often do we lean toward temptation and sin because we trust our flesh rather than our Father? Paul put it this way, this I say, then walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, if our trust, if our trust is complete, if our trust is, is in all our ways, if we're trusting with all of our heart, if that trust is complete, if that trust is, I'm all in trust in God, then God is going to lead us in the right way. And we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. But he reminds us the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And in those moments when the devil comes to tempt when the danger comes into our life of going astray, we can't trust ourselves. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. 
They're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. When the devil comes, you can't say, no, I don't feel like doing that, Satan. I'm not going to do that. You're going to lose every time. You've got to trust in the Lord in those moments. Years ago, a young man from a college nearby came to a revival meeting I was preaching, and he was not a Christian, but he had been invited, and at the invitation time, he came forward, and he said to the one who met him, I want to talk to him, <laughs> pointed to me. And so the pastor informed me, and after the service, I went down, sat in the front row with him, and, and uh, he revealed to me that he was not a Christian, that he was lost, and on his way to hell. And he said, I deserve it. He said, I'm involved in terrible sin, moral sins. And he felt lost. He felt unworthy that God would even love him. Well, you don't have to look too far in the Bible to figure out that thinking's wrong. You can show him lots of places in the Bible where God loves a sinner. That's who he came to seek and save. <laughs> and I took him to passages like 1 Corinthians 6 where God says such were some of you. And he names all these sins and a lot of them moral sins. I said eh, such were some of you, but you're washed, you're justified, you're sanctified in the Lord Jesus. And it wasn't long until he put his faith and trust in Christ. But he realized right out of the gate, within the first five minutes, he said, I'm going to have some battles. I mean, I, I've been living this life for all this time. And he said, I've got friends, and I live in a dorm, and I, I'm at a secular university. And, and he said, it's everywhere. He said, how in the world am I going to go back to campus tonight now as a Christian and, 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 and possibly live a life that would please God? I said, well, there's a way to do it. You've got to get a sword in your hand. And that sword is called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He said, what do you mean? I said, you let, you've got to memorize the word of God. You've got to get the word of God in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He said, give me some verses. <laughs> I wrote down 40 of them. And I said, now just start memorizing them tonight. Just, just get one down. That way when the temptation comes, when, when you're tempted to lean toward the flesh instead of toward God, you, you can use the scripture as that sword of the spirit to fight the battle. He came back the next night. He had memorized 20. And he was so happy because he was winning victories. Now, he didn't sleep all that night. He said, people were knocking on my door. People were tempting me. I was getting phone calls. He said, I just prayed and memorized scripture, and God gave me victory. Well, that meeting's ended. He came every night. We tried to help him, and the meeting's ended. And he asked if I could continue to help him over the phone and things like this. And the pastor said, sure, let's do that. Let's kind of co-labor together on this guy and see if we can keep him going. And, and so over the next years, um, we tried to help him along with the pastor, and, and uh, he got victory. I mean, it was amazing how God worked in his life. And all of those past moral sins that he has been involved in, I mean, his life just radically changed. He, he repented, he, he, he put it behind him, and he, he, he became a new man in Christ. But one night he called me, and I knew something was wrong immediately. He was, he was a mess. He was frantic. It was late at night. And he called me and he said, I got you. I got you. I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. And he's just, he's, he's, he's half crying. He's, he's anxious. And, and I, I'm thinking, oh no, he fell. You know, I'm thinking, get, get, get ready to counsel him because he's fallen. And now he's going to have to get back up. And you know, that's where I was going in my thinking. And finally I said, what's going on? What's going on? He said, I got you. He said, I, I have conquered 
all of my temptations in these moral areas and God has helped me with his word and I, I've memorized it and I, I know how to fight it off. But he said, I am a nervous wreck. He said, I, I'm so afraid I'm going to disappoint the Lord. I'm so afraid because of all these temptations around me that one of these times I'm going to, I'm going to just be weak and I'm going to fall into that sin again. And he said, I just, I worry about it. I worry about it. I don't want to displease the Lord. And he said, you know, when I got saved, Brother Getch, I was only smoking one pack of cigarettes a day. He said, now I'm smoking three packs a day because I'm so nervous that I'm going to disappoint the Lord. I love counseling new Christians. This is awesome. And, and so I'm trying not to laugh. And he just spilled all that out. And I said, okay, now just calm down. I said, how did you get victory over the temptation in the moral areas? He said, I memorized the Bible. I memorized scripture. I got the sword of the spirit and I, I fought the devil with the Bible. I said, okay. So how do you think you're going to get victory over smoking? Got real quiet. And all of a sudden he said, oh, I got it. Hung up. And what did he do? He memorized verses. And that night he quit cold turkey. I'm just saying, sometimes in those moments where the devil's kicking you and he's tempting you and he's trying to come on this way, there's going to be times where all of a sudden your trust in the Lord isn't as strong as it was at the beginning of the year. And now in this danger moment, if you start leaning to your own understanding, I mean, this guy on the phone told me I've tried to hide them. I've tried to quit buying them. I, 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 tried to, I, I tried to space them out between more minutes. I mean, he had tried everything humanly. It didn't work. And he had to come back to the foundation of trust in the Lord. And you do that through his word. So we lean in our decisions. We lean in our dangers. But then we lean in our dependence. Look at verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, here's where we like to stay in control. Here's where we're good on this trust in him until we start talking about our money. So put your seatbelt on. Because... Because this is, this is a hard area to trust in him. Because money affects everything in our life. Whether you have it or you don't have it. Whether you have more than enough or not enough. You, it, it's never enough. And so this is where we often want to stay in control. We don't want to yield this trust. Because when we look at money, when we look at what we need to depend upon in a material way to survive this world, we start taking a pencil and a paper and we start figuring and we're leaning to our own understanding and it, it, it doesn't make sense. And Paul said, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? In other words, everything we have came from him. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So everything we have, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. So everything we have is from God. And so now we come to this matter of dependence and, and we say, well, I need these financial resources. I need these material things in order to get through life. And so we begin to figure and we begin to calculate and we begin to try to put it on paper. And we, we got to just stop for a minute. God isn't asking you for your money. He's asking you for your heart. My son, give me thine heart. Trust in him. Give me your heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Right? So 
we got to start there. If he doesn't have our heart, he's never going to have our checkbook. He's never going to have our purse. He's never going to have our wallet. If he doesn't have our heart, it's kind of said in a reverse way, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, wherever your heart is, is where your treasure is. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. If your heart is in worldly things, you're spending your money on worldly things. If your heart is on spiritual things, then you're spending your money on spiritual things. They go together. So God says, give me your heart. God doesn't need our money. I love Psalm 50, verse 12. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Hey, if God needed a, if God needed the point tonight, he wouldn't tell you. If God needed a Sunday tonight, he's not going to tell you. He owns all the Sundays. He owns all the ice cream. He's not going to tell you, hey, can you please give me the offering because I'm a little short. <laughs> I need to go get a hamburger. God says, no, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I own it all. Now, if he doesn't have our trust in this area, he really doesn't have all of our heart. So my advice tonight is, why don't you put him to the test? Put him to the test. Malachi 3 says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, a tithe is 10%. And by the way, that's equal to all of us. That's the same for everybody. 10%. If you make a dollar a week, God says, give me a dime. If you make $10 a week, he says, give me a dollar. If you, if you make $100 a week, he says, give me a 10. If you make $1,000 a week, he says, give me 100. And that's the same for everybody, 10%. And that's the starting place for giving. And God says, I want you to bring that into the storehouse. On the first day of the week, when you come together, as Paul said, uh, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, bring your, bring your, bring your offerings into the, into the church, into the local church, because that's God's vehicle to carry out the Great Commission. And so bring that tithe, and he says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you'll not be able to, to you won't be able to contain it. He's saying, watch what I do with that other 90%. He said, but really, guys, when I put that on paper, and I started figuring that with my calculator. I, I just, that 90% doesn't cover my bills. So what you're telling me then, if, if I give my tithe, then God's going to give me that 10% back? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you give that tithe and watch me bless that other 90%. Now that's equal for all of us. But then he says, bring all the tithes, bring all the offerings. Oh, well, at some point then, God ratchets our trust up a little bit. And we have a missions conference, and God speaks to our hearts, and we, these missionaries need help. They need to be able to get the gospel out. And so God begins to move on our heart, and he says, I want you to give by faith $5 a week. And again, it doesn't make sense on paper. In your own understanding, that's not going to work. But he says, trust me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Then February 19th comes, and we're like, oh my. <laughs> Maybe I'll sit out of church for the next three weeks because I don't, that's not going to work. I, 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 I don't know how I can, I can give any more. I mean, I'm tithing. I'm trying to help some missionaries. I, you know, now, now, now we've got to get this building paid for. This, is, this doesn't work on paper. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Lean not to your understanding. You say, well, Brother Gash, do you mean does that mean like if, if pastor takes that offering on February 19th and, and I give $1,000, does 
I just trust God. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I, I, I give God $1,000 for that kid's city building. Does that mean God's going to put $1,000 in my checkbook the next day? No, that's not what it means. But he might keep you from having a root canal this year. Of course, if you're a dentist, he might have two people walk in tomorrow needing a root canal instead of one. But what God is saying is, hey, you can trust me, Amen. right? How I take care of you, that's my business. I'll take care of it. I own it all. So, so, but I'm trying to teach you to trust me in your dependence. And this is the hard one because, Lord, I got, I got to go get gas. I got, I got, I got, I got to get something to eat. I, 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 you know, I, I got to manage this. You, I'll trust you everything else, but I need to manage this. I need my own understanding with this. No, 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 God says... Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, and I need your heart. If you're going to trust in the Lord with all your heart, I need this part too. So we can lean in our decisions. We can lean in that, in, that, in that danger time when the devil tempts us. We can lean in this dependence. Fourthly, we lean in our discipline. Verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. There are going to be times where God needs to spank us. Where God needs to discipline us. Now why does he do that? Why when, when we start to lean a little bit or we start to go astray a little bit and, and, and God brings something into our life to remind us, hey, come on now, you said you're going to trust in me. And, and, and you're getting off here, and so God, you know, cracks the whip a little bit. And sometimes we think, why does God hate me? He doesn't hate you. He loves you. It's proof of his love. Parents don't discipline their children because they hate them. Now, the child thinks that. But the parent is not disciplining a child because he hates him. It's because he loves him. That's why I don't discipline your kids, because I don't love them like you do. <laughs> right? You don't discipline somebody else's kids. You don't love them as much as their parents do. Their parents discipline them because they love them. And God is saying, you're my children. And so when you need a little correction, I'm going to correct you. And God says, blessed is the man whom thou chastenest and teaches him out of thy law. You're blessed when there's chastening, when there's correction in your life, whether that come in the form of conviction through a sermon, or whether that come through maybe a, a, a test in your life that God is saying, hey, come on now, let's get back on track. Why do we get so upset with God when he is trying to discipline us? God brings a little, a, little, a little tension in our life because he wants to correct us because he loves us and we get mad at God. Well, I'm not going to church then. I'm not listening to any preaching. I don't understand why, what, you know, why God would hate me so much that he's brought this trial in my life and he's allowing this to happen in my life. I just lost my job. Why is this happening? Why, why is there this fire that's destroying my, my, my trees? God, if that's who you are, forget it. We, we pout and we complain and we, we get mad and we blame the church or whatever and we just give up. Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not now the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? You're going to have correction in your life. Why? Because we're not perfect. We're still growing. And we have to be corrected at times. And it's not because God hates us. It's not, it's not because God has something against us. It's just the opposite. But in those times, if we're not careful, we lean to our own understanding. Number five, we lean in our diet. Verse 13, 
Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it, wisdom, is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, wisdom, is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Where we lean is when we start feasting on the junk food of social media or entertainment or the self-care experts or the business gurus or the wealth experts or the scientific researchers instead of the Word of God. And we gorge ourselves on the endless buffets of the experts and the elite and the entertainers and the economists and the ecclesiastical and the educators and the establishment and the experienced and the emotional and the extremists and we snub our nose at the, at the, the milk of the word whereby we grow. We snub our nose at the, at the meat that we need to discern both good and evil. We look at the Bible, we say, well, that's old fashioned. That, that's old school. That, that's just old hat. I need something more. I need something better. I need something that's relative. Well, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make the way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. The statutes of the Lord are, are, are right. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is pure. The commandment of the Lord is sure. I mean, God promises that this diet, this book, will change your life and will bring success to your life. See, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, truly furnished unto all good works. So the word of God is profitable for doctrine. That's what's right. It's profitable for reproof. That's what's wrong. It's profitable for correction. And when we, that, that word means to set up straight again. So when the tower begins to lean because of some of these other factors we've talked about, what do we have to do? We've got to go back to the word of God that corrects us that sets us straight again. Adding a couple more steps isn't gonna solve the problem. You know, trying to, trying to you know, uh, change the look by putting a, a straight roof on it or a level roof on it, it's not gonna help. We've got to deal with the foundation and the foundation is the word of God. Our trust in the Lord is based on his word. So tonight, are you leaning? Has God exposed some damage in the foundation tonight? Can you truly say, I'm trusting in the Lord with all my heart? Your decisions? When the dangers come? In your dependence? for sustenance in life, in the disciplines that God brings, in your diet. The Rana Plaza collapse, also referred to as the Donka Garment Factory Collapse, occurred on April 24, 2013 in Dhaka District, Bangladesh. The collapse of this eight-story building that housed five garment factories took less than 60 seconds.
resulting in 1,134 deaths and 2,500 serious injuries. The Reina Plaza collapse was caused by structural failure, ranking as the deadliest structural failure in modern history. 60 seconds is all it took for that building because of an improper structure, an improper foundation, crumbled. God says, trust in the Lord. Our theme says, trust in him. But it's not just a theme. It is the very structure that will keep your life from collapse in 2023. So quit leaning. Quit ignoring the warning signs. 60 seconds at this altar tonight might keep you from collapsing in 2023. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. That's a command. And a weakened trust is going to cause for a weakened life ready to collapse. May it not be said of us in 2023 that we started out Trust in the Lord. But then as the weeks and the months went by, we began to lean. Let's spend some time fixing the structure. And the structure is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the teaching that you have here in Proverbs 3 for us. And certainly these are basic areas of our life, but they're everyday areas of our life. They're, they're, they're constant. And they are opportunities daily for us to trust, and there are opportunities daily to lean. And Lord, tonight in this week of awakening, this revival, may we commit ourselves to trust in the Lord. So that as these times come when we're prone to lean, we will easily be corrected by your word and thus avoid collapse. It is not your heart nor the heart of this church for any life in this room to collapse. It is not your will that any perish. There, it's not your will that any person in this room would go to hell. You want to save them tonight. And it's not your will that any Christian would find themselves six weeks, 12 weeks, four months from now in collapse. That's not your plan. But to keep it from happening, we've got to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. As heads are bowed tonight and the music begins, let's stand quietly. In a prayerful heart, if God has put his finger on a structural flaw tonight, why don't you come? 60 seconds at this altar could save your life, your marriage, your family, your kids from collapse. Remember, we can't just get an 80% on this test. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta ace this one. We gotta get them all right. 
Because to hang on to any area of our life and lean on our own understanding is going to cause collapse. Only a full trust will keep us from a fractured trust. Prove the Lord tonight in those areas of trust and he will direct your paths. He will guide your life. He will provide your needs. He will keep you in that hour of temptation. Take your time in prayer tonight. This is a week of surrender, complete surrender to the Lord. Tell him the areas you're trusting him more. Ask him to give you strength and wisdom. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, if you'd like to know what it means to have a relationship with Christ, to have your sins forgiven, you can come. There's still time. There's folks here that will talk with you. You just step right out. We'd love to talk with you. If you need some counsel, there's men, there's ladies here that can talk to you. Father, you tell us in your word not to lean to our own understanding. Forgive us, Lord, when we try to convince you, or even worse, when we don't even think of you. May this be a year when we as your people are abiding in you and trusting in you and leaning on you. Father, may we know your presence and your power as never before. May we yield to you, Lord, whether it be our finances, our time, our talents, May we give our lives to you in complete trust. And Lord, may you be glorified in 2023 through us, through your church. And we'll thank you and praise you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.